Welcome to Radio Friends. The day after Thanksgiving. Good to have you with us today. You're all full, right, from yesterday's meal. Well, sit back and relax for another 10 minutes or so because we have Joan Stack with us from the State Historical Society. Always an interesting lady to chat with. Welcome. Hello. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Oh, great. Yeah. So today we're talking about a uh, an exhibit that it's already open yes. at the State Historical Society. Yes, it just opened earlier in November, and I think it's a really exciting opportunity for us to come face to face with the Native Americans who were living in the 1820s and 1830s, right here in here, America. Right yes. Here. Okay. It, what, what's the name of the exhibit? The name of the exhibit is James Otto Lewis's Aboriginal Portfolio, which was the name of the book that was published with these images. The Aboriginal? The Aboriginal Portfolio. Now, we don't tend to use that term for Native Americans now, no. but the term Aborigines, which means a Native people, was used at the time for Native Americans. So that's where it took, when, when you think of the Aborigines uh, in, in Australia... That's yeah. a term for the native, yes, the native, the native people. peoples. Yes. And so what we have with the Aboriginal portfolio is a group of images, most of which were done at these councils during diplomatic encounters. Between, now, these were not photographs. Oh, no. These are drawings that James Otto Lewis, who was a member of these diplomatic teams, these diplomatic teams would go and meet with the Native Americans and negotiate for issues of land, issues of relocation, many of the things that eventually didn't go too well for the Native Americans. Many of them did eventually lose their land uh, during some mm. of these negotiations. And, and you wonder why did they have to negotiate at all because yes. this was their land. Yeah. This was their land. And unfortunately, that wasn't quite how the government saw it at the time. And so you find that there is a bias to a certain extent in especially the writings that accompany the, the Aboriginal portfolio. But what's so great about it is that James Otto Lewis felt that these people were important enough to document their appearance. So you get these wonderful portraits of some of the great leaders and most of these, the original paintings were done in the 1820s, then they were made into lithographs and hand-colored in the 1830s. Now, you brought one today. Yes. And I, I, there's no way we can describe it on the radio as to what it looks like. This looks like a picture taken with a beautiful modern camera today. <laughs> it is amazing the talent that people had to be able to draw a portrait like yeah. this. And if you imagine James Otto Lewis accompanying these groups and then having the Native Americans sit for him, and then he would do portraits. Yeah. And uh, the particular portrait that I brought here today is one of the most famous Native Americans of that period, a man by the name of Black Hawk, who uh -huh. was a member of the Sauk tribe. And he's very interesting because he actually rebelled with a group of people in his tribe and attempted to wage war on the United States. There's a famous war called the Black Hawk War in 1832. This was done after Black Hawk surrendered in 1833. Now we're showing you a picture right now. Go to kbia.org, click on talk shows and then radio friends. Look at this picture. It, it looks like a photograph. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. This is... This is a lithograph, but it's been hand-painted. The original image of Black Hawk that James Otto Lewis did is lost now. It burned in a fire at the Smithsonian. And this is Black Hawk that we're looking this at. This is Black Hawk. And Black Hawk, the helicopters and various teams and all kinds of things have been named after Black Hawk since. He was, in a way, the quintessential noble savage. Now, that term is, a, is a, in some ways, a somewhat pejorative term, but it explains the way Way some European Americans understood Native Americans during that time. What happened to Black Hawk is he ended up surrendering. It was obvious that the European Americans and the government had much more uh, power than his group of Indians had. So he surrenders, but he then is taken by the government around to various towns and cities in the United States. And he carried himself with so much dignity, even in defeat, that he was very much admired by the European Americans of the time. So Black Hawk, I think, is an interesting example of somebody who 
tried to rebel and tried to save his people, and it just was not possible at that time in 1832. Now, what's kind of interesting as a connection to Missouri is that there were a number of Missourians who went and fought in the Black Hawk War. Black Hawk was trying to maintain control over areas of Illinois, so it wasn't far from Missouri. And in fact, many Sauk, uh, members of the Sauk tribe did uh, live in the Missouri region. So Major James Rollins, who was from Columbia, one of the founders of the and University of Missouri. We've got a road named after him. Yeah, several roads. He's uh, important uh, here for uh, the history of Columbia. He is called Major James Rollins because he was a major in the Army during the Black Hawk War. So the Black Hawk War was important for the history of this region. Black Hawk, in fact, when he was captured, ended up uh, spending some time in St. Louis at the beginning of his captivity. So this particular example is a Native American who does touch the history of Missouri. But in can some you ways. imagine how these Native Americans felt? Oh yeah. How they felt. This was their land. This was their home. Yes. And we came in and we took it away from them. Yeah. And, and I, we claimed that it it's ours. And we tried to give them a voice in the exhibit. I tried to, when I could, quote uh, the Native Americans themselves. There's not, that's not always possible, but there's at least one example of a label that in which I include a long speech by a Native American who says, you keep promising stuff to us. We give you what you want, and then you just come back for more. And that's the history. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the, 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 the turmoil, the sadness yeah. that they must have felt going through all of this. And, and having to relocate again and again and again. And that's what happened to Black Hawk's people. The chief who ended up taking over for Black Hawk is also very famous. It's K.O. Cook, our watching fox, and there's yeah. an area of Iowa named after him. So in a very small way, this exhibit is a tribute to them. Oh, I hope so, and I hope people can, again, it gives you an opportunity to meet these people or get make some sort of contact with yeah. them. If people want to see it, they can come down to the museum, a State Historical Society, when, Joan? Uh, we are open to the public from Tuesday through Saturday. Okay. And Google us. All right. Thank you, Joan Stack. It's always a pleasure to have Thank you here. You. So interesting. Uh, Monday, we're going to talk about cornea transplants. Our program, directed by Travis McMillan, Reynolds Journalism Institute, Audio Pat Akers, KBIA. Our floor director is Sifun Uyung. And our assistant producer and guest coordinator, Uncle James Mouser. See you Monday. Bye-bye.